The humanitarian crisis in Gaza reaching a breaking point. The Red Crescent Society now saying the second largest hospital there is no longer functioning due to the depletion of available fuel and power amid Israel's ongoing war against Hamas. And doctors at the largest hospital, Al Shifa, tell ABC News they're doing everything they can to keep three dozen premature babies alive after at least three died after a missile struck nearby. It shut down the medical facility's backup generator and doctors say more people will die if that hospital doesn't get the life-saving supplies that it needs. Israeli Defense Forces continuing the bombardment there, claiming the hospitals are being used as shields for Hamas command posts. IDF troops also ramping up relentless attacks in Gaza, continuing raids today on the outskirts of the Al-Shati refugee camp. Our Patrick Rival is in Tel Aviv and has more on the escalating tensions there in the Middle East. Hostilities in the Middle East widening. The Pentagon says U.S. forces conducted new airstrikes in Syria, hitting a safe house and a training camp used by Iran's armed forces and militant groups supported by the country. An official confirms Iran-backed fighters were present at both locations. The sites are linked to at least 46 drone and rocket attacks on U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria since mid-October, which resulted in dozens of injuries. Elsewhere in the region, a helicopter crash near Cyprus left five U.S. service members dead. The Black Hawk helicopter was carrying special operations forces involved in a nighttime refueling training mission when it went down in the eastern Mediterranean due to a mishap, according to the Pentagon. The elite troops were training to potentially evacuate American citizens. Nine Americans are still missing since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, including an orphaned toddler. Israel says the group is still holding 239 hostages. This comes as Israel's forces push deeper into Gaza City. The Israeli military releasing video from tank-mounted cameras showing almost total devastation. And there is intense fighting around hospitals, which Israel claims Hamas is using as control centers. Inside those hospitals, tragic scenes, including doctors performing surgery on injured Palestinians by flashlight. We do not want to see a firefight in a hospital where innocent people, helpless people, uh, people seeking medical care are caught in the crossfire. At Al-Shifra Hospital, premature babies removed from their incubators because there is no electricity, according to a doctor there. At least three have died, the doctors say. We are sure that we are alone now. No one hears us. And Patrick Rebel now joins us with more. So, Patrick, let's just start with the latest development. The Al-Quds Hospital now out of service completely. What do we know about the patients and where are they being traded now? Yeah, we know that the Al-Quds Hospital, Gaza's second largest, is no longer functioning, according to doctors there. The Red Crescent said they did attempt to make an evacuation of the hospital earlier today, but they said that they had to turn back because of continuous shelling. We know that the Israeli Defense Forces are now fighting very close both to that hospital and also to the largest hospital, Al-Shifra. I mean, we were up close to Gaza earlier today. We were about three kilometers from it, and we could hear extremely heavy firing, extremely heavy shelling coming from the, Israeli, um, from the Israeli positions and also almost constant airstrikes. There were warplanes in the sky all day, pretty much constantly over Gaza. So let's talk more about what's happening at Al Shifa Hospital now. Uh, what can you tell us, Patrick? Yeah, the situation at Al Shifa is just dire. I mean, we've been talking most days to doctors there, and you know, over the course of those days, it was already nightmarish the situation that we were hearing. But we now know that there is no water there. There's very little fuel. There are also large numbers of, of bodies now that have been unburied lying in the courtyard there. Uh, one of the doctors there told us that they've had to close the windows and doors of the hospital and of the stairwell because of the smell coming from those bodies, but also as well because of the garbage that is just piling up inside the hospital because people are too frightened to even step outside. They're also saying that there's been incidents of snipers firing into the hospital. And of course, we've seen these horrible pictures of these premature babies, these 39, um, now 36 premature babies lying there who've been taken out of the incubators because there is not enough fuel to, to, to keep those incubators going. We know the IDF has said they want to try and evacuate those babies, but so far doctors say the fighting around the hospital is not allowing that. So you visited one community that was just ravaged by Hamas uh, back on October 7th. Tell us about this kibbutz and also what the Jewish volunteers who are still combing through the aftermath 
by the way, what, what they've been telling you and, and what the road to recovery looks like for them. Yeah, I mean, this was actually the first time that I visited one of the kibbutzes that was attacked by Hamas on October 7th. The IDF is regularly doing these visits for foreign media because they want people to see what Hamas did there and they want it not to be forgotten what happened there. And I have to say I was very, I was surprised when we were there and we saw that the cleanup is still going on. It's because, according to Jewish tradition, um, a, a, a person who has died, their entire body should be buried. And that means that there are volunteers right now going through these destroyed houses basically looking for every spot of blood and every hair and every piece of flesh from these people who are often killed in appalling ways using grenades, um, people machine gunned in their homes. And so we were with a young volunteer who actually led us through this charred house, this young 23-year-old guy, and he took us into this safe room that was completely burnt, completely blackened, and on the floor there was just congealed black blood that he is now going to mop up. And outside on the street, there were just these white bags everywhere that were filled with bloodied items, um, pieces of cloth with blood on them that they had cut from sofas where people had been machine gunned. Um, you know, very, very gruesome. And while we were there, we also met with a woman, a resident, who, who, had, who had survived the attack. She spent 36 hours um, in her safe room, and she, she spoke to us. We asked her, you know, what does she think can happen with Gaza? What should happen there now? I think we can actually hear a shot from her right now. All my life, I'm 63, all my life I used to be on the left wing, but now I realize, it's not just now, I realize uh, it's whether them or us. Yeah, as you heard her say, it's, it's them or us. And she said, for, you know, for years she thought there should be outreach to Gaza. She talked about how um, Palestinians had been invited into the kibbutz to have work there. And she, though, said that it had completely gone. Her husband was killed. Um, he was shot dead in a jeep outside her home. And she said that she now doesn't believe right now it's possible for the two communities to, to live together right now. Until Hamas is destroyed, she fully supports the, the military operation going on in Gaza. And she said it's them or us. She no longer believes that for the time being it's possible. She said she doesn't think that Palestinians want peace. And so I think that really did, you know, tell you the mood that you find among many Israelis here and why it was helpful for us to go there because it helps us understand the rage and the fury that is feeding um, Israel's war in Gaza where they are now you know, p prosecuting this ferocious onslaught against Gaza. Let's talk about southern Lebanon while we have you, Patrick. You know, the fight between Hezbollah and Israeli forces intensifying. What more do we know about this uh, war escalating into a wider conflict? Yeah, I mean, obviously, one of the main concerns since this, since this war began was that Hezbollah in Lebanon could become involved. And I think people felt that that was fading away, that Hezbollah was signaling that it didn't want to become directly involved. But recently, the, the, the shelling up there from Hezbollah, the use of drones, the strikes up there has been intensifying, particularly in the last couple of days. And here in Israel, people have started to talk again about it, saying they worry now that we are getting much closer to a possible conflict with directly between Hezbollah and Israel. And, and, you know, and as, as Israel pushes deeper into Gaza and as it gets closer, perhaps, to really threatening Hamas and trying to completely destroy it, it does going to raise the question, is Iran and Hezbollah, are they just going to sit by and allow that to happen? And I think many people here have strong doubts about that. They don't think that that is likely. And so there is grave concern that very much there is still this possibility that Hezbollah could become directly involved in this war. Patrick Rebel, appreciate your reporting. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.